Uh, silver point is a medium that's 500 years old or more, but it's really only started to come into its own in the last five or six years. Silver point has been around for 500 years, as I said, and I know you've seen silver points, but you may not have known they were silver points because they, could, they look almost exactly like graphite drawings. And graphite, in fact, replaced silver, which is why a lot of people have never heard of silver point, because it was a medium that existed and then didn't exist, and now it exists again. So I give you a sense of the history of it by putting up this completely esoteric quote from the 13th century. Because you have to imagine a time before graphite pencils existed. People made fine line drawings with soft metal. They drew with silver, they drew with copper, they drew with gold, all of which makes mar make marks on paper. But they're not the same kind of marks that you get out of a pencil. For instance, as I'll explain a little later when I do a demo, materials, you can't erase silver point like you can erase pencil. Um, if you put graphite on paper and you make a mistake, your line's out of place, or you're doing a watercolor over top of the drawing, you can then go back and erase the lines that you make with pencil. Silver point doesn't erase. It, you can remove it, you can scratch it away, or you can take an eraser and obliterate it, but then you can't rework into it. So it was a medium that art teachers in the 13th century used to teach their students how to draw with precision, and more importantly, how to see. Because you spend more time seeing and less time drawing if you can't correct your mistakes. So it goes all the way back to um, the book, uh, Encyclopedia on the Properties of Things. It had a small section on art materials, and he describes silver as a drawing medium. Let me show you what one of these old silver points looks like. This is uh, uh, Jacques Marte, I don't know, that. Jacques Marta Hesdin, if anybody speaks French, uh, a famous artist and a teacher. And what you're looking at right here is a, a sketchbook, a student sketchbook, made out of leaves of wood, boxwood, that were very, very thin, almost like shingles thin. And they were coated with paint. And that's the secret to silver point right there, and that's why I've got all this stuff on the table. Because silver, although soft enough to draw with, is too hard to draw on paper. Paper's too soft, and the silver is metal. So the way to make silver point work is to coat the paper with something, or in this case, to coat the, uh, the leaves of boxwood. And you can see the streaks of paint. And in fact, the kind of paint they used back then was a really simply made water-based white paint. Uh, if you know anything about art history, it, sometimes they call it body color, but it really is just white pigment mixed with a little bit of rabbit skin glue, and it makes an aqueous whitewash. And they would coat their sketchbooks with it and draw on it. And you can see how fine the silver line is. And in fact, in some of these drawings, you'll notice that there are almost two different colors of drawing material, some of which has turned brown, and some of which stays that kind of graphite color. And you can see that the artist is using two different kinds of metal to draw with, which is why silver point is also sometimes called metal point, because artists would use lead, which is the dark bluish color, and then they would mix it with silver, which tarnishes. And when silver tarnishes, it turns this luminous brown, almost a sepia-toned color. And that's why you're seeing two different characteristics of metal marks in this drawing. Interestingly enough, in these old sketchbooks, they weren't permanent. When the students were, had worked up their sketch, they would just paint over it and keep going. Or sometimes you could take a cloth, a wet cloth, and just wipe off a layer of the whitewash and then keep drawing on top of it. So these sketchbooks were really kind of impermanent things. The fact that this one survives at all is really interesting. This is what it looks like. That's the, that's the author's hand. I think the photo is attributed to my wife, who was at the exhibition at the National Gallery. And she took a picture of me. I snuck a, a little magnifying glass into the show. And so this, this thing is, is like this big. They're like index card sized. And that's what the sketchbook looks like. It's just a wonderful, delicate, Lovely little thing. Rare as hen's teeth. Um, I think there's only two of them that survive. One of them is at the Morgan Library in New York, which also has a nice collection of silver points. And I think the other one is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in France. But only two of these things survive. So that gives you an idea about how old silver point is. But one of the things I led with 
was that you've probably seen silver points, but not, but have no, but don't know what you're seeing. This is a really famous piece in the Boston Museum. Saint Luke, of course, the patron saint of the arts, sketching the Virgin with uh, the infant Christ child, and there, of course, is Jerusalem in the back, which looks almost exactly like Bruges. <laughs> and you know, and they're all dressed like that too. But what's he drawing? If you look closely. That's not a pencil, and it's not a paintbrush, and it's not a, uh, a pen and ink type uh, stylus with a nib. It's actually a shaft of silver metal. And as, if you look carefully, you can see that it's pointed, tapered, on both ends and a little wider in the middle. And one end is very, very shiny because he uh, keeps pointing his silver point to draw with. And if you look at the paper, you can see his little sketch of the model. And this gives you an idea, it's not exactly the right, it's not exactly the right thing, because she's not wearing a wimple. But this gives you an idea about what Rogier van der Weyden silver points look like. Very, very pale. They're, they don't have the graphic impact of a charcoal drawing. They're not colorful like a sepia chalk drawing. Um, and they're not quite as punchy as a pencil drawing. They're very, very pale and very, very light. And you can look in places, oh, I wish I had my, I used to have a little cat toy that I used to point at the screen with. Um, but you can see where the, the ground, the white paint, has kind of let go over the years. And in fact, when you draw very, very heavily with silver to get that kind of darkness that you would want to see out of a pencil drawing, you begin to scratch right through the paint down to the boxwood or the paper or whatever the drawing's on. So when you see very old silver points, you'll often see in the darkest areas light coming back through. And that's the paint being chipped away by the silver point stylus. It's a lovely drawing, isn't it? I think this one was in the show. Uh, the British Museum lent it to the National Gallery and then showed it again. This one was also in the show. Uh, Fra Filippo Lippi, who was uh, um, Filipino Lippi's son. Uh, Fra, if you don't know him, is, is short for uh, fratello, meaning monk. So the, the, the monk was the, the son of the uh, Filippo Lippi, Filipino Lippi. Or maybe it's the other way around. Filipino, I think, was the son of the monk. But here's a silver point drawing that's in the chiaroscuro technique. If you've, uh, has anybody heard that word before? Yeah, good. And it means, this is a quiz, this will be on the quiz. Like the, the further back you get the more, less defined the shadow is? Uh, it, had, it does have to do with shadow and light. Chiaro is the Italian word for light. And scuro, like obscure, is the Italian word for dark. So chiaroscuro is light and dark technique. So here, uh, Filippo Lippi is using dark with the silver drawing in the, uh, the fine line and light by adding more of white paint. And the way that it works is because the paper is toned, which is really interesting because it gives you that idea that silver point has to be done on paint on top of paper. So it's this three layer process of drawing on top of paint, which is placed on top of paper. And why not use color paint? It's just exactly what he does. The drawing itself, it's, it looks a little washed out on the screen, but it's this lovely red, uh, almost a brick red uh, ochre color uh, that's really, really luminous. And if I can, uh, I'll show you the picture that's in the book, and you get a sense of how potent that color is. One of the reasons I love showing this drawing is because this predates the Italian Renaissance by about 50 years. And the drawing looks so modern. It looks like a Degas drawing from about uh, 1850. It's just, that is precisely one person drawn with such uh, attention to detail. Um, you know, the, even the expression on her face is just lovely. It looks thoroughly modern to me, even though it's, uh, you know, about 550 years old at this point. So not only in the Italian Renaissance, but also in the Northern Renaissance. So you've seen French, you've seen Italian. Here's a German drawing, Hans Holbein, uh, who also worked in, uh, in Italy. Um, another example of silver point, and he also added mixed media to his drawings. So there's a lot of people working in silver point who think silver point should be an absolutely pure medium, just silver. But even from the very early days, artists were mixing it with ink for the very dark lines, for white, uh, adding in the highlights, and Holbein is a great example of that kind of thing. But one of the things you're noticing about these drawings is that they're extremely precise. 
And even from its earliest days, Silver Point wasn't a medium given to overt expression. It was a, it was a medium for very subtle description, for capturing likeness, for capturing, you know, uh, in Albert Durer's case, he did, I think the next one coming up, he did uh, uh, animal studies and life drawings in silver. And Silver Point was taught to students precisely to teach them to observe. It was a way to, to get them to learn to control their hand and to control their eyes so that they spent more time looking than drawing. And this is a great example of that because this is a drawing that Albert Durer did when he was about 13 years old. Four, yeah, 1484. So he was about 13 years old when he did this. And, you know, it's a great, great drawing of the young Durer, a self-portrait, looking like your average dumb kid. Notice that even then he had a wonderful uh, ability to draw folds and hair and likeness. Remember that he drew this when he was 13, so I'll show you a drawing later on that will blow your mind. And here's a drawing from a little bit later, probably uh, when he was in his 40s, of a greyhound. This drawing is about as big as an index card. Uh, I'll show you. I, I, had, um, I had a picture of uh, the actual picture in its frame, and it's just this tiny little thing about as big as an index card in this gigantic frame. And it's just such a lovely, sensitive little drawing of this dog. And you can see all the way that the tonality is developed with cross-hatching. And yet it's very, very light. This is a great example of how silver, when it tarnishes, it not only turns a little sepia color, but it tends to evaporate. It tends to get lighter as it gets browner. The drawings almost disappear. There's almost nothing there. And an old silver point drawing has a patina that's just to die for. There's nothing quite like a 500-year-old drawing when you see that you know, the drawing has almost evaporated, the paper itself has gotten darker, the silver has a patina and a tarnish. Uh, just lovely. I used to tell my students, you know, um, when we would do silver point in classes, I would say, oh, that's a great drawing. Just stick it up somewhere and forget about it for 100 years and then look at it again, and you'll see that lovely patina start to develop. This is a drawing I wanted to uh, bring up again. Uh, because this is a drawing that Leonardo did when he was a young kid. So, Albert Durer, when he was age 13, Leonardo, uh, when he was in his 20s, did this drawing. And we all know that uh, Leonardo, uh, you know, probably one of the greatest artists that ever lived. This is a drawing that I think most people have seen at some point in their life without ever really realizing it was a silver point drawing. They don't exactly know what it is. Maybe they think it's a pen and ink drawing done with sepia ink. Maybe they're just completely oblivious and they think that Leonardo used pencil, which didn't even exist back then. But this is a drawing done in silver point. And if you look at the size, it's written in centimeters, but you get an idea it's about as big as a sheet of notebook paper. And incredibly detailed. And one of the drawings that inspires lots and lots of young people to become uh, artists and to learn to draw. And an example, Leonardo's sketchbooks are world famous. And in, in, in those sketchbooks, owned by the Queen, um, are many, many examples of metal point drawings done on tinted paper. I once had the, the great privilege, we went to the Royal Ontario Museum when they were having a show of uh, Leonardo's silver point drawings. And um, what was interesting about it is every little drawing, not only drawn on the front but the back of the paper, was in a tabernacle frame, meaning that the frame was sitting on a tabletop where you could see one side of the drawing and then walk around and see the other side of the drawing. And the frame just kind of sat there like a game of uh, a battleship, you know, just right in the middle. And to look at these drawings, they were like holy relics in a darkened room with a single spotlight on one side, each drawing about that big, sheets from the, from, the, from the Queen's notebooks that she owns. And so wonderful and precise. And Leonardo had a really interesting way of toning the paper dark so that the silver would be that much darker when he drew on the dark paper. So rather than exploiting the contrast of a light line on a pure white piece of paper, he was working on a dark piece of paper and developing that famous what, what he called sfumato which was that way of blending the tones from dark all the way through to the point where that blue paper almost looks like the lightest color that you could imagine. And he would get, you know, if you look at the example of the horse's withers on the right margin of the paper, the modeling is just out of control. It's just so beautifully observed and drawn. 
So Leonardo, probably the end of Silver Point, because right after Leonardo was working, Michelangelo comes along, and his drawings in charcoal and red chalk are so potent and so powerful and so really high contrast that many, many students forwent drawing, uh, learning to draw in silver point and began immediately working in char char uh, chalk and charcoal. And so you begin to see silver point start to disappear. After a big 50 year span from about 1450 to 1500, silver point becomes rarer and rarer and harder to find. There are examples though. One, Hendrik Goltzius, uh, a terrific engraver. Hendrik Goltzius notable because uh, he had damage to his drawing hand um, such that he could hold an engraver's burin and do wonderful engravings, but his hand was almost too crippled to draw with, and yet he was able to produce works like this. So it's, it's you know, I would say it's a great life lesson that you never, you're never unable to do that which you can conceive of. And there you'll see in this drawing, he's got his silver point stylus and a sheet of prepared paper waiting. So 1589, so this is about 80 years after Leonardo was working, and you begin to see Silver Point a few places. Rembrandt was only known to have made one or two Silver Points. This is a really interesting one, because this is, this is done uh, during his wedding. Uh, so right after he was married to Saskia, which I think was his second wife, who knows art history? Uh, Hendrik, he was his first wife, and Saskia was his second wife. But uh, on his honeymoon, he made a little silver point drawing of Saskia, his second wife. That's probably why she looks tired. But in his wonderful characteristic uh, style of very, very loose and sketchy lines, which doesn't really lend itself to silver point. It's not the kind of modeling that you see Leonardo doing. It's that more sketchy Dutch virtuosity. And of course, he inscribes it. I used to, I used to have on, uh, in my PowerPoint what the inscription made meant, but you'll see right uh, down in the bottom right corner, 1633, and it says something like, to my wife on our wedding, uh, you know, with all, with all my love. And then Silver Point's gone. It just disappears. It is not anywhere in uh, art history for about 200 years. And interestingly enough, you'll see it pop up again in England at the end of the 19th century. And if you know anything about art history, you'll know that there's a movement of artists at the end of the 19th century. England was becoming uh, kind of industrialized at that point. And a lot of the arts and crafts that had been done by people were kind of taken over by factories. Things like chairs and wallpaper, et cetera, were produced for a mass market, industrial scale. And there were a group of artists, led by artists like William Morris, if you've ever heard of him, who began a new movement called the Arts and Crafts Movement, of reinvestigating the old ways of doing things. And one of the kind of outgrowths of this was learning about the way medieval artists made their artwork. And you see another movement, kind of a companion movement to Arts and Crafts, called um, the, uh, the, um, the Pre-Raphaelite Movement. And these artists were trying to figure out how old art was made. And as they were looking into this, they began to discover Silver Point. Because there was a, a writer a, a, in the early 14th century called Cinino Cinini. He was an Italian guy, good guy. And he wrote a book on the Handbook of Arts called Il Libro dell'Arte, the Book of the Arts. And in it, there is a, there is a paragraph, not even a paragraph, a sentence that, that talks about Silver Point and how it's done. And what he does is he says, mix a little of your, of your powdered bone with some spit and spread it on a piece of paper and you should be able to draw in silver. That's it. That's the entire recipe for silver point that existed from about the 14th century up until the 1900s. And these artists took that and they began to run with it. And they commissioned uh, uh, manufacturers like Windsor Newton to produce silver point paper and silver point tools. And Windsor Newton discovered that if they coat paper with clay, clay coated paper, that you could draw on it with a silver point tool. And they mass manufactured silver point tools, and you begin to see a renaissance of silver point. For the first time since Rembrandt did his last silver point in 1633, silver point starts to show up again around 1899. And this is a, an English artist named Joseph Edward Southall. He was part of that arts and crafts pre-Raphaelite movement. And you can see him investigating 
the kind of artwork, let's see if I can just go right back. The drawings look a lot like the very early Netherlandish drawings from about the mid 15th century. There's a lot of white paper showing, there's very little, there's very little outline, there's a little bit of modeling. And they're using hatching to develop tone. Even his monogram, 1899 in the lower left, looks a little bit renaissance-y, doesn't it? These artists were really trying to reimagine that entire period of art. What's interesting to modern art history is that these particular artists, like Joseph Southall and Thomas Wilmer Doing, uh, Thomas Wilmer Doing, who's his American counterpart, they began to bring this knowledge of making medieval art um, over to America. And um, Southall came to Harvard University and, to begin, and began teaching artists there. And one of the artists that kind of picked up on this was this American, Thomas Wilmer Doing. You see the, 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 the dates are about the same. They were contemporaries. And Silverpoint makes the jump for the first time ever from Europe to the United States. And from this period on, artists would hand down knowledge of silver point from teacher to student all throughout the 20th century. Joseph Stella, who was an uh, American regionalist artist and a very important early American realist, um, he picked up on silver point and he did some amazing silver points. He began to work a little bit more in mixed media and would work watercolor into his drawings. And there's a wonderful example in the book uh, I brought with me that I can show you. But you see, it's still very much in that realist observational vein. Otto Deeks, an example of contemporary, I guess modern, not contemporary, but modern, modern silver point work. Artists teaching students and students handing off the knowledge to other students throughout Europe and the United States. And Silver Point begins a revival. There are a few artists keeping it alive throughout the 20th century. Paul Cadmus, who I believe was a, a, a student of, um, uh, oh, I can't remember the Thomas Wilmer doing. One of, the, one of the Americans who learned it from the, uh, um, the British guys, he began to do Silver Point. And here's an example from 1968. But if you know anything about Cadmus, he worked he, all through the 20th century. Probably uh, some of his works from the 40s and the post-war era are his best known uh, small paintings. But he continued to do life drawing in Silver Point all throughout his career. And if you look carefully, it's a little hard to see in the slide. He's using the chiaroscuro technique of Fra Filippo Lippi. He's starting the drawing on toned paper and silver point and then adding strokes of white body color into the drawing to develop that light on top of the paper color with the darks being added. He had a whole series of these drawings. Uh, notice this is male nude number 62. These drawings are just wonderful. Once again, they're notebook paper size. These are not monumental works of art. Paul Cadmus uh, was the teacher of one of my teachers. Um, well, I'll show you a picture uh, from the book later on. But uh, so uh, Paul Cadmus taught uh, my teacher, Roger Anlicker, who studied and I think also taught at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, Roger Anlicker then moved to Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia, where I went to school, and also Harvey Dinnerstein went to school. Harvey Dinnerstein is a very, very well known contemporary realist artist who worked at Silver Point. And this piece was very influential to me when I was at Tyler School of Art, just a, just a little guy, you know, about not even 20 years old. I started doing Silver Point. And I learned it one day when my teacher uh, did a Silver Point demo in class. Uh, Charles Schmidt was his name. It was interesting because if you, if you know anything about Philadelphia, Philadelphia is kind of in the mid-Atlantic region and it, the weather there is always quite mild. And one day in the middle of winter, it snowed in Philadelphia. We got one inch of snow, the entire city shut down. No one could get around. It's very much like Denver when it gets a couple inches of snow. And the model didn't show up for our life drawing class. And my teacher had to figure out something to show us. So he went into his office and he came out and he pulls out a, basically what you see on the table in front of you here today. He had some paper and board and paint and some silver point tools. And he said, here, let me show you a drawing technique. I was about 19 years old, 19, 20 years old, maybe not even that old. And here it was, 
Here was how to draw like Leonardo da Vinci. So that, that drawing I showed you, the bust of the warrior that we all saw as young men growing up thinking, I want to draw like that. Here was the secret to drawing like that. And so for a couple years, I taught myself you know, how to draw in silver point with this, the help of this teacher. And every day in life drawing class, I would go in and make these terrible little silver point drawings of the figure model. And then one day, I actually produced a good drawing. And my teacher said, would you like to be in a show? We've got a bunch of people who are doing silver point work. There haven't been many shows. This work was in the show. Harvey Dinnerstein was about 60 years old at that time, and I was about uh, 19 years old, and my teacher, Roger Anlicker, and Paul Cadmus was in the show. And he was the, the guy I just showed you there. He was about 90 at that point. Uh, show was 1994, so how old was he? He was 90. So he was the oldest artist in the show, and I was the youngest artist in the show. And I became absolutely hooked on it. I've been doing it basically full time ever since. And this piece was very influential to me, so much so that I tried to make my own. But, you know, I'm, I'm not so great at drawing people as Harvey Dinnerstein is. So I drew a simple still life. And more examples of this kind of work are what's in the, in the museum here today. So this is my homage to Harvey Dinnerstein's Mercedes. And you can see it's about the same kind of color paper. And I became very interested in the idea of floating the image in the middle of the page with nothing around it, because those were the kind of works that I saw that I really liked. So I'm including myself in with all these great artists. It's not, it's not ego. It's just to show you the kind of, it is ego, it really is. But it's just to show you the kind of lineage of silver point. But in addition to people who were working realistically and in that tradition that goes all the way back to the 1500s, there were artists that picked up where Joseph Stella left off and began to work in a more abstract way. And one of the first evangelists of Silver Point, and probably the most important working, artist working in Silver Point today, is Susan Schwab. And she picked up on it, I think her earliest works were in the early 70s, maybe even before then. And she started out working realistically with botanical forms and eventually migrated to working in a more almost purely abstract way. And her work at this point is very much about the patina and the colors of the different metals, what we call the luster of the different metals. So if you look at the list of metals in her work, silver point, gold point, copper point, on black gesso paper on panel. Now, I'll show you a little bit of what drawing on black gesso looks like, but you begin to see the luster of the different kinds of metals. That very first image I showed you by uh, Jacques-Marc de Hesdin, the student sketchbook with the difference between silver and lead. She's exploiting the difference between the lusters of different metals to make patterns and textures of different colors, albeit very subtle in her work. Other artists have picked up on this kind of modern way of working, contemporary way of working, and they do really interesting work. Lori Field, who works out in New York City, um, she, just had a, she just had a wonderful, uh, a large show um, in New York of some of her work. And uh, she does work in a very kind of whimsical, almost Alice in Wonderland motif, but it's still very grounded in realism with a lot of imagination put in. Really, I always like her work, and a lot of it is very much like this. Some of them get quite large, in fact. And she just covers the paper with florals and portraits and animals and lovely things. And then another interesting artist working almost in a purely abstract way is Carol Prusa. And what's interesting about Silver Point and what a lot of contemporary artists have discovered is once you realize that Silver Point is done by drawing on paint and not really on paper, you can almost paint anything and draw on it. And what she does is work on these very, very large styrene forms that she has made. And then she gessos them and then covers them with these uh, geometric shapes. And what's interesting about uh, some of the work, and you can see all the kinds of different shapes she has in the background that she works on, is sometimes these styrene forms she will light from within with little LED lights. So they become decorative, almost... Uh, um, kind of interior forms, not quite lamps, but, but forms that change the way that the gallery looks by being lighted from within. Programmed internal light is what she calls them. So this is uh, three views of the same piece, I believe. One where the lights are off and one where the lights are adjusted higher as you move from left to right. 
Interesting stuff. So once you begin to realize that you can draw on anything, as long as it's painted, you can unpin yourself from the tiny little index card with a picture of a dog on it. And there are artists who work on walls. Um, this is about the point where I'm going to move to the table and begin talking a little bit about how it's done. But there are artists who, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember her name, it's killing me, I'm getting so old, I can't remember it. Oh, but I've got it written down, which is good. Um, she covers, she puts uh, silver thimbles on her fingers and then uses her hands to dance over a painted wall to create all kinds of wonderful patterns. So when you begin to take away the idea that you have to draw from life, and you can work in a more expressive, abstract way, you can create works uh, on anything. The secret is, of course, metal draws on paint, and whatever surface you paint is what, uh, is what the marks show up 